Yeah. You get to have the pleasure of listening to me go through these slides. It's going to be one of the greatest things you've ever experienced. We're going to talk about probability and probabilistic reasoning. Uh, major topics that we talk about are basic probability, finding the probability space, which is an interesting process, random sampling, and then finding probabilities in various distributions. And this we are actually going to go over in class because I want you to get some practice with the z-score calculator and kind of visualize what's going on with uh, different distributions and what I mean by, you know, how likely are we to get a value or a range of values. But to begin with, basically probability is just the likelihood that an event will occur. Um, for probability, our equation is the probability of outcomes classified as what we are looking for out of the total number of possible outcomes. A very simple example is, you know, when you flip a coin, you have two possible outcomes, head or tails. A si uh, well, you know, you could get an edge. It happened to me once, actually. It's quite a fascinating story. Uh, but usually you get heads or tails. And so if I'm looking for heads, I have one head, out of two possible outcomes, heads or tails. And I express that as 1 over 2, which is just my 1 over 2, or I can express it as a decimal. And probabilities are usually expressed as decimals. I don't care which one you use in this class because to me they're the same. Another example would be rolling a six-sided die. You know, if you get a, a die and it's not loaded or anything, the probabilities are equal for each side. So probability of getting a 1 is uh, expressed as P parentheses 1 equals 1 over 6, meaning that I only have one option that I'm looking for out of six possible outcomes. Likewise, for rolling an odd number, I can get a 1, a 3, or a 5 because all of those satisfy my odd condition and that equals 3 out of 6, or 1 half, or 0.5. For rolling a sum of 4 on two six-sided die. Now I have a couple different ways I can get that, right? I can get uh, a 1 and a 3, a 3 and a 1, or two twos. So that means that there are three different ways that I can get it. Now, on two dice, there are 36 possible outcomes. I have a 1 for my first row, followed by a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4, a 5, or a 6 for my second row, so I have 6 options. If I roll a 2 on my first die, then I also have another 6 options for that, and so on. So there are 36 total, and that simplifies to 1 over 12, right? Should make sense at this point. Uh, just to visualize that a little bit better, this is my six-sided die, right? I have these six options. The probability of getting a four is one four out of six possible outcomes. What's the probability of getting an even number? Well, those are the things that I classify as being even. Two, four, six out of one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, a lot of times I will be talking about different ranges of values. Now, in this case, suppose that I want to know the probability of getting a number greater than 3. Well, greater than 3 does not include 3. So I'm looking at 4, 5, and 6 out of my possible 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So I have three options that are greater than 3. That's my 3. And then I have six total options. That's my 6 equals 0.5. Note, uh, again, greater does not include the boundary number, just like less than does not include the boundary number. If I would say, however, at least 3, then I would say that I include 3, 4, 5, and 6. 3 is included in at least. Same thing for at most. What's the probability of me getting a number that is at most 3? Well, that includes 3. So it would be 1, 2, and 3. And, and at least and, and at most are the same thing as saying really less than or equal to or greater than or equal to. So you have to be careful about how things are worded and so on. And we'll go over more examples like that in class. So just to think about what are the probabilities for the following with a single die? Probability of getting something less than 2, 
less than 1, greater than or equal to 4, and less than or equal to 4. I'll give you a minute to think about these things. You shouldn't take too long. Uh, less than 2, right? I only have one option that's less than 2. 2 is not included, so it's really just getting a 1 is my event classified as less than 2. And then 2 through 6 are the other ones. Less than 1, well, I don't have any options that are less than 1, so that is a 0 probability. So I would have 0 out of 6 chances of getting this. Greater than or equal to 4, well, that does include 4, so I'm including 4, 5, and 6. And then less than or equal to 6. In this case, right, that includes everything on my six-sided die, right? So everything is less than or equal to six. So to talk about probability spaces and judge probabilities, we have to figure out both sides of the formula. The total number of outcomes that are possible, what are all the options, and how many of those outcomes are the ones that I actually want. So if I had 10 chocolate chip cookies and 10 Oreos, what would be the probability space, general probability space for cookie type? Well, I have 20 total cookies, 10 of which are chocolate chip, and 10 of which are Oreos. If I wanted to know what the probability of me randomly picking the chocolate chip cookie was, or randomly getting a chocolate chip out of this population, it would be 10 out of 20. If I talked about the gender in uh, this class, in particular, including me, it would be two males and four females, six total people. The probability of randomly selecting a male or getting a male by chance would be two out of six. Getting a female would be four out of six. If we think about uh, decks of cards, things like that, if you're unfamiliar with cards, this is what a whole deck looks like. Uh, you have four suits. You have 10 numeral cards and then three face cards in each suit. So uh, that comes to 40 uh, number cards and 12 face cards. So if we talked about card color, we also have half of the deck is black and half of the deck is red. So I could say that it's 26 out of 52 are black and 26 out of 52 are red. We're excluding jokers, of course. Card suit, that's my clubs, uh, spades, hearts, and diamonds. Well, now I have 13 of each, right? And so 13 out of 52 would be the probability space for any particular suit. For tens, well, now I'm just talking about these four cards. So it's four out of 52 or one out of 13. Face cards. Now I have 12 out of 52, and jack of spades, I'm just talking about one card, well then that's one out of 52. And again, it's the total number of options on the bottom and what exactly I'm looking for on the top. Now, if we are talking about uh, sequential events or subsequent events, we need to consider how the probability space expands and how it goes from one time to the next time to the next time, and so on. For example, if I flip a coin once, what would be the probability space? In this case, it is one out of two. One out of two for heads, one out of two for tails. If I flip a coin twice, though, what's the probability space for all my options? And if I do that, if I look at the first flip, well, I can get heads or tails. For the second flip, now I have twice as many options, and because I have two options here, I multiply it by two again, and I know how many outcomes possible I have if I do it two times in a row. And I'm not just isolating the second flip. Right now I'm talking about uh, what would be my combination of outcomes. Because if I looked at the second flip, it would be exactly the same as the first flip. Uh, but if I look at the two together, well, if I get a uh, head on the first flip, then I could get another head. And the probability of me getting two heads would be one out of four. Uh, a head, then a tail, would also be one out of four. A tail followed by a head would be one out of four. And then two tails would also be one out of four. Uh, if 
I am asking then what's the probability of me getting two heads if I flip a coin twice? Well, then I know it's one out of four. If I ask what's the probability of me getting a head and a tail? Well, then I'm talking about this option or this option. I'm not talking about the order. I'm just talking about one head and one tail. And so then it's one half. If I ask the question, what's the probability of me getting at least one head? Well, now I'm talking about any of these cases where there is at least one head. And I have this one, this one, and this one. No heads here. So it's 3 out of 4 or 0.75. Now suppose I'm talking about dice again, and suppose that I have uh, two die, or two dice, and I'm rolling them both, and I want to know what my possible outcomes are. Well, here is uh, all the po here are, are all the possible outcomes, and here are the probabilities of getting that particular number. Probability of getting a two is one out of thirty-six. Probability of getting a three is two out of thirty-six. A four, three out of thirty-six, and so on until we get to sevens, and sevens happen one-sixth of the time. Uh, and then we start going back down the other way until we get to double sixes, only one out of 36 again. Uh, <clears throat> if I'm talking about rolling one six-sided die, we talked about the probability space consisting of six possible outcomes. In this case, now we have 36 possible outcomes. Now, when we start talking about drawing people for research and looking at research, we have to consider where we get our data from. And if our probability formula is probability of outcomes classified as the thing that we want of the total possible outcomes, uh, we have to consider that we are drawing things in a particular way. And there are two conditions that hold. First of all, each individual in the population has to have an equal chance of being included in the sample. So the probability equals 1 over n for everyone. So I can't be picking my friends. I can't just be picking the people who are next to me. In reality, if I want a real random sample, I, there has to be an equal chance of anybody, regardless of where they are or who they are, of being in my sample. Just like if I'm talking about the Oreo cookie thing, or rolling the, the dice, or flipping the coin, right? I can't set it down on a head. I can't look in the cookie jar as I'm picking. I can't feel around uh, to get my Oreo or my uh, chocolate chip, whatever I want, because that is not keeping my probabilities equal for everyone. The second thing is that if more than one individual is selected for the sample, Every item must be replaced immediately after it is selected. So every single selection has the same probability. And the example that I, I give here is that the probability of drawing the Queen of Hearts, for example, one card out of a 52-card deck, is 1 out of 52. Now, if it is not selected, and that card that I pick, say I pull in and I pull out the Ten of Hearts, right? If I don't put that back in, I have now changed the probabilities going forward. Now the probability of getting the Queen of Hearts is one out of fifty-two rather than one out of or one out of fifty-one rather than one out of fifty-two. Another example using the cookie jars. Suppose you have ten chocolate chip cookies and fifteen Oreos in a cookie jar. What's the probability of selecting an Oreo? Well, it's fifteen out of twenty-five. I have twenty-five total cookies. 15 of them are Oreos, so that's the probability. If I randomly sample five cookies, notice I'm randomly sampling, and I pick three Oreos and a chocolate chip, what is the probability that I will select the chocolate chip for the fourth cookie? Oops, that should be the fifth cookie. Sorry about that. No, oops, not the fifth either. There we go. Now we're cooking with gas. Uh, what's the probability that I will get a chocolate chip for the fifth cookie? Well, in this case, it's 10 out of 25, because if I'm randomly sampling, I'm putting each cookie back in the jar as soon as I pull it out and look at it. So all my, prob my probabilities have to stay constant from one selection to the next throughout the whole process. Now, if I were not randomly sampling, if I was not replacing, what would the probability of my fifth cookie being a chocolate chip? Well. 
instead of having 25, I've already taken 20, or I've taken four out, so I'm down to 21, right? And I've taken one of my chocolate chips out, so now I only have nine in there. So it'd be nine out of 21 if I was not replacing. If I was being selective and I was looking in the jar and picking the one I want, well, unless I have terrible hand-eye coordination or I'm blind or something, I don't know. Uh, the probability is about one, that if I want a chocolate chip, I'll get a chocolate chip. If I don't want a chocolate chip, I probably won't get a chocolate chip. So, if I randomly sample 10 cookies and my first nine were chocolate chip cookies, what is the probability that the 10th is also a chocolate chip? Well, I have to make sure that if I'm randomly sampling, I'm putting those cookies back in, I'm not looking, so the probability of the 10th being a chocolate chip is the same as it was for the first nine selections, 10 out of 25. The probabilities do not change. Again, another example, suppose I'm flipping a fair coin. What's the probability that the 21st flip will be heads? And I'm not talking about anything that happens in between. I'm just focused on the 21st flip. Well, in that case, it's 50-50. Suppose I have flipped 10 heads in a row. What is the probability that the 11th flip will also be heads? It's still 50-50. And this is the big gambler's fallacy. If you like to play cards or you go play the slots or you bet on, I don't know, you know, you keep betting the same lottery numbers and think that because you hasn't been called that you're due, uh, that, that doesn't really, that's not true. <laughs> you're never due. The probabilities are always exactly the same from one time to the next. So the probability, even if I have 10 heads in a row, the probability for the 11th being heads is still 50%. It's not less than just because I'm due for a tails. I'm not due for anything. The, the probabilities are independent of one another. Uh, suppose that in cards, say you go to the uh, casino and you're playing blackjack, right? Uh, you've lost 10 hands in a row. You keep getting 12 and 13. Am I due? Should I start betting a ton of money? No, <laughs> probably you can't, you can't look at it like that. And, and it's interesting when you think of people who are lucky or people who are unlucky. You know, we always think that things even out over the course of our lives. But in reality, some people are just kind of, you could say, destined to have unlucky lives. The bounces will always go poorly for them. I mean, not always, but uh, for the most part. Uh, and when we talk about random sampling, this will be a good Thing to talk about in class. You know, when you think of luck and random chance working out to your benefit, as some of you may have lived lives uh, that have been very lucky, and some of you may have been very unlucky, but it doesn't mean that your, your luck will change. It doesn't mean you will stay the same. Uh, you just don't know. The probability for things happening are always independent, and you just may be a person who has a lucky run of things. Now, if I'm about probability and frequency distribution, suppose I have this graph and it's representing test scores, right? And I have 20 test scores here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, so on. Uh, 1, 2, 2, 4, and so on. Now, I can look at probabilities in this graph just like I would for particular events. And I can ask it, like, what proportion of the total area does the score 10 represent? Well, it's 1 out of 20, uh, so that, that means that it's 0.05 uh, or 5%. What proportion of the total area does the score of 8 represent? Well, here I have 5 out of 20, right? Uh, or 20%. I'm sorry, 25%. Uh, if I'm talking about proportion of total areas for any particular score, it's just how many individuals I have at that score divided by the total number of scores that I have. I can also talk about ranges. What proportion of the total area do the scores above 6 represent? Well, I'm not including 6 because it's above 6. So I go ahead and count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So 13 out of 20 or 65% of my scores, or a probability of 0.65.
that I would randomly select and get a score above six. At least six, now I'm including the sixes, so I add these three to my 13, and I have 16 out of 20, or 80%. Uh, below five, I'm just talking about these three, 15%. And when we think about random sampling, it's the same thing as identifying what proportion, and when we think back to how coins are set up and how dice are set up, we are really just talking about splitting up the outcomes into percentages, right? And then what's the percentage, how, what percentage of outcomes are going to be ones? What percentage of outcomes are going to be twos? And so on, if I'm randomly sampling. Now, we can look at finer grain distributions, uh, like the curve that we look at with our z-scores. This is a zero, right? Standard deviation of one. We got about 68% people between negative one and positive one, about 90 5% of the people between 2 and negative 2, and so on. And we can look at this and say, you know, what is the probability that a randomly selected z-score will be greater than 0? Well, 50%, because half the scores are above the mean, right? Oops. Uh, greater than 1? Well, I can add up these percentages and come to my conclusion. Exactly 1? Uh, there we go. Uh, I would say that exactly 1 is about infinitely small because any particular value here does not take up any real amount of space uh, when we're talking about you know an example a value of five and I stopped after a few zeros here but if I kept going and I was talking about exactly five basically nobody's there so I'm usually talking about ranges of score you know greater than a value greater than zero or less than a value between two values or outside of two values. And as we go through uh, into this next part, and this is what we're going to do in class, so you can stop doing stuff here, uh, we're going to work on finding probabilities and distributions after a short review of the other stuff that we talked about. And we're going to be using the z-score calculator. This is the web address. Uh, feel free to just kind of look at it on your own and so on. And we're going to work on that, breaking down z-scores, raw scores, and so on, and then we're going to play a little Monty Hall game that's very interesting and very fun, and talk about making decisions based on probabilities. All right, but that is it. I'll see you on.